Welcome, everybody. Okay. So I am Mark Rosewater, the head designer for Magic the Gathering. So uh, we do something a little weird. Uh, we make a game, and we put it on paper. Um, you can come to the Experimental Game Workshop. It's, it's something new, kind of cutting edge. Um, so anyway, uh, let's walk through my game employment history. So back in 1995, I went to work for a little company called Wizards of the Coast. That's it. That's, that's my employment history. <laughs> uh, so I've actually spent the last 20 years designing the same game, of course, Magic the Gathering. Uh, and not a lot of people actually design a game for 20 years. Not a lot of games last 20 years. Um, but what I found was over the years, as I worked, Wizards went through a lot of changes, and Magic went through a lot of changes. So, for example, this was one of our main villains, Nicole Bolas, when I started at the company. And there he is now. So, we, Magic has changed a lot over the years. In fact, in the 20 years since I've been there, we have made 85 randomized booster products, 69, uh, 69 non-randomized products, we've done online licensing and other miscellaneous products, and have produced over 14,000 cards. So in 20 years, we've made a lot of magic. So in those 20 years, I've learned a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes, done a few things correct, but I've had a lot of lessons. And so I decided for my first talk ever at GDC, I would share those 20 years lessons that I learned. And I decided I would do 20 lessons. I figured I could average one per year. Um, but this isn't chronological. Um, this is not like, here's the lesson of 1995. Um, these are just lessons I learned over, put in an order that makes sense to me. Hopefully by the end of this, it'll make sense to you. But these are 20 lessons. I got 60 minutes. Go. Okay, lesson number one. So for this one, we're going back to Time Spiral back in October of 2006. So we had a little uh, mechanic or called um, Suspend. And Suspend basically lets you trade time for money. Money and magic being mana, of course. So the idea essentially was normally in magic, you cast a spell, it happens right away. But Suspend said, well, it's cheaper, but you have to wait s several turns for it. So this is Aaron Ephemeron. It takes four turns once you play it. So you cast it, wait, wait, wait. Okay, you get Aaron Ephemeron. And then as soon as people got it, they would attack with it. In magic tapping, you have to turn it to attack. So they would attack with it. Um, but they weren't allowed to do that because the magic rules say you can't do that. So we were trying to figure out how could we communicate to people not to attack. So we tried a lot of different ways. Um, some got less and less subtle to try to encourage them to say, no, you can't attack. You can't attack with this creature. Um, and in the end, the solution was, no, guys, you can't attack. And then finally we said, okay. You can't attack. We'll change the rules. The rules just say you can attack. You, you want to attack, you can attack. So that brings us to lesson number one. Fighting against human nature is a losing battle. Um, so they say in game design you should know your audience. So our audience is human. Um, and they come with a complex operating system. Um, but while it's quirky, it is something that can be understood. There's an entire field of psychology trying to understand it. But, as game designers, we have to be forewarned, humans can be a bit stubborn. So what I like to say to people is, don't change your players to match your game. Change your game to match your players. Don't get yourself into a fight that you're probably not going to win. So lesson number one, fighting against human nature is a losing battle. And there are things throughout time, the cell phone, there's things that get invented that change human behavior. But don't assume your game is going to be one of those things, and that when you try to make humans change for your game, your game is going to suffer. Change your game to match your audience, which are human. So here's what I'm going to do. Each lesson I'm going to put up on the board, and at the end will be a pretty picture that you guys can take of all the lessons. Okay, lesson number two. So this one goes back to 2012, Avacyn Restored. So the card I got the most complaints about was a card called Gristlebrand. In fact, I got way more complaints about this card than any other card. Why? Was it a power level issue? 
Well, no. Here's Jerry Thompson, a very good Magic player. A whole article explaining how awesome Gristlebrand is. Gristlebrand's a very powerful card. In certain formats, it's actually very, very strong. Okay, was it a flavor thing? No. Liliana is one of our most popular characters. In fact, she made a deal with four demons to get eternal uh, youth and, and beauty. And he was one of the four demons she made a deal with. So no, he's super flavorful. So what was going on? Well, he was a seven power creature with seven toughness. You could pay seven life to draw seven cards. And he cost eight mana. <laughs> so lesson number two. Aesthetics matter. So I just explained how you have to understand human behavior. That's important. But you also have to understand human aesthetics. I'm sorry, human perception. I'm getting ahead of myself. You have to understand human perception. So I went to Boston University College of Communications. I took a lot of classes there. So one of the classes I took was a class called aesthetics, which is also known as the philosophy of art or the science of beauty. Uh, and the idea of aesthetics is they study how humans perceive the world. You literally study, like, how does the brain work? How do the senses work? How do the eyes, the ears, how does it all come together? How do people perceive the things around them? And what they do is they look at all the different qualities that humans cross culture, and they try to figure out what exactly to humans is aesthetically pleasing. And while there's some variance from person to person, there are just things about the way the human brain works that make certain things more appealing than others. So in your game, players expect the components of the game to have a certain feel. Now, I'm not talking about just visual aesthetics. Magic actually does that pretty well. But I'm talking about whether the game component has the right qualities. It, it has to feel right. You know, things like balance, symmetry, pattern completion. And if you fail your, to provide the aesthetics you want, it makes the players feel ill at ease. It distracts them from the focus of your game. And it makes them pay attention to what the game isn't instead of what the game is. So I just said, don't fight human nature. Don't fight human perception. So lesson number two, aesthetics matter. The, the, the key element here is that humans like to perceive things in a certain way. And if you fight that, it just draws attention away. Now, you might make your game because you want to do that. Maybe you want them to feel ill at ease. That's okay. You can use this to your advantage. But be aware that how people perceive things affects how they take your game in. And that don't disconnect from the aesthetics unless you mean to. Because otherwise, it just draws focus. Okay, lesson number two. Aesthetics matter. Up on the wall. Lesson number three. So for this one, we go back to Innistrad and Dark Ascension. This is back in 2011, 2012. So this was our gothic horror sets. We had vampires and werewolves and zombies. So one of the things I did very early in this design team is on the whiteboard, we wrote up just cool-sounding names, just things that sounded evocative. And then a lot of the cards, a lot of the popular cards from the set came from that whiteboard that we would put things up and we would design to match it and we ended up with a lot of very evocative cards, some of the favorite cards in the set. And it all came from just matching the idea of what sounded cool, what would make a cool sounding card. So that gets us to lesson number three. Resonance, resonance is important. Okay, so I'm gonna use a lot of metaphors. So one of my metaphors is humans, your audience, the people who can play your games, come preloaded. Designers don't have to start from scratch that the audience already has pre-existing emotional responses that the game designer can build upon. For example, Magic didn't invent zombies. Players came to the game with a pre-built emotional relationship with zombies, created from years of watching pop culture. So Magic was able to build on that knowledge and make a rich emotional game experience. Your audience has a deep deposit of emotional equity in pre-existing things. And as game designers, that's a tool you should make use of and build upon. So lesson number three, resonance is important. The key to remember is your audience comes to your game with a lot of stuff already there. As a game designer, use that. Build upon it. That it's, I'm going to talk a lot today about you're trying to create emotional responses with your audience. Well, they, they come with emotional responses built in. You as game designers should take advantage of that. Okay, up on the wall. Lesson number four. So for this one, we go to Theros from just a couple years ago. So Theros was our Greek mythology-inspired set. It had us sort of following, you know, lots of cool ideas from Greek mythology. 
So one of the cards in the set was called Trojan Horse. Um, and the idea of the card was you would give it to your opponent, and then every, uh, every turn, a soldier would pop out of it. Trojan Horse. Now, there's no Troy in the game because we had our own world. We, our, our version of Troy was called Akros. So it was called a Crone Horse, not Trojan Horse. Um, and we play tested with it, and it was really popular. The players really liked it. Um, but then the creative team decided to make one small change. Uh, instead of being a horse, we've done horses, let's make it a lion. Let's make it a crow and lion. So we changed the card, and then I started getting complaints in playtesting. The people, they didn't like the card. They didn't understand the card. They were really confused. Like, what, what is this card doing? So we changed it back to a crow and horse, and then everybody liked it again. <laughs> so lesson number four is to make use of piggybacking. So resonance has another valuable use. It's a teaching tool for game mechanics. So it makes use of something I call piggybacking. And what piggybacking is, is the use of pre-existing knowledge to front load game information to make learning easier. So for example, in Magic, we have a mechanic called flying. It is the easiest mechanic to teach. Because all I have to say is, you know, like it flies. You know, that it matches it, that, that I don't have to teach a lot of the rules because it does, even though in a vacuum it ha there's rules with it, but it so matches expectation, it so matches what people already know that it's easy to learn. So now I'm going to give my, my one non-magic example today from Plants vs. Zombies, designed by a guy named George Fan, who also is a magic player. Um, so he was trying to make a tower defense game. So the idea is that things are attacking and you have units you're putting to stop the attacks. Um, but one of the key things is once you place a unit, you can't move it. And George didn't like the fact that normally they, like, they'd be soldiers. It's like, well, if my soldier is right here and right next door, I desperately need the help, why won't the soldiers just go right next door and help you? Why, why is that the case? So he's like, could I pick something? Could I pick something to be my units that the audience won't think they can move? And so he chose plants. Plant. It can't move. It's in the name. It's planted. And so he chose it so that people would realize, oh, well, once I plant my plant, I have no expectation the plant's going to get up and move anywhere. Also, he needed invading forces. He needed something that kept coming in waves. So he chose something that represented that, that people would expect the zombies to slowly come and come in waves. So a lot of people think, oh, he just picked two funny things. Oh, oh, they're plants. Ha-ha, they're zombies. But no, he carefully picked them because the choice reinforced the game. That by choosing those, people understood the game easier and faster. So remember, you don't have to teach players things they already know. So lesson number four, make use of piggybacking. That resonance, not only will it emotionally attach your, your audience, it also is a, a rule for... It's a, tool for teaching, that you can use it to help people get your game quicker and faster, that flavor, while it definitely has an emotional appeal, can help you with mechanics. So put it up on the wall. Lesson number five. So for this one, we go back to Odyssey, back in September 2001. So in Magic, there's a, this is an idea called card advantage. Uh, it is a strategic thing that people learn so they get better at the game. So in I'm doing a very abbreviated version of this for people who understand, actually understand card advantage. The idea is, if in my hand and in play, I have more cards than you have, okay, then I, I have an advantage. If I have more cards than you, strategically, I'm at an advantage. So we were doing Odyssey, and I said, okay, well, what if I could turn card advantage on its head? So, for example, there was a card called Patrol Hound, where you could discard a card from your hand to give it an ability. But it didn't matter. You didn't even care what it got. You didn't even want the ability. You just wanted to discard cards from your hand. Well, why would you want to do that? So there was a mechanic in the set called Threshold. And what Threshold said is, when you got seven cards in your graveyard, things would change. So for example, the Crows and Beast, which is a 1-1, one, one, became an 8-8. Eight, eight. So the idea was, if you had seven cards in your hand, you could discard them all to the Patrol Hound to give your Crows and Beast and make it a 1-1 one, one, into an 8-8. Eight, eight. How did that go over with the audience? The problem was, yes, you could, you could make them do that, but they didn't want to do that. You know, instead of throwing away their entire hand, they'd rather, I don't know, play the cards in their hand. So it leads to lesson number five. Don't confuse interesting with fun. So there, there's two different types of stimulation. There's intellectual stimulation. So, hmm, interesting. And there's emotional stimulation. <laughs> fun. Those are different things. 
So for example, in magic, looking at the cards is intellectual stimulation. Oh, I, let, let me see what they do, and let me, mm, that's interesting, and what, how do they design the set? And there's playing with the cards, but that's more about emotional, like, oh, is it fun? Am I having fun playing this? So we tend to think of ourselves as intellectual creatures, but we tend to make most of our decisions based less on facts and more on emotion. So your game can speak to your audience on an intellectual level, or it can speak to them on an emotional level. Now, both are valuable, but when you speak to the players on an emotional level, you're more likely to create player satisfaction. So lesson number five, don't confuse interesting with fun. Look, when we talk about why we make games and what we want the audience to get out of the game, it's an emotional response. You know, we talk about fun, and maybe you're trying to create other emotions. There's games that do things other than produce fun, but you want to get some emotional response out of your audience. So there's a difference between being interesting and being fun. And make sure that you're not confusing the two, because being fun more gets the result that you want. So put it up on the board. Lesson number six. Back to Innistrad. Our gothic horror set, remember, with va vampires, werewolves, and zombies. So I was the lead designer of this set, and I was trying to figure out what exactly we wanted the set to do. So what I did is I thought back to the pop culture that inspired this, you know, where the audience would get their resources from, where would they think about the, the horror genre, and that's movies and TVs and books. Um, and what I realized was if I sort of followed the guideline of the source material, I knew what I wanted out of my audience. Fear. That when you look at the horror genre, that it's about scaring the audience. It's about creating a sense of terror, a suspense, of dread. So when I built the set, I actually built mechanics with that in mind. So for example, normally in Magic, we only have one face, but we did a double face card, cards that had stuff on both sides. So one side could be a human, and the other side is a, is a scary werewolf. Or it could be Dr. Jekyll, on the back it was Mr. Hyde. Or it could be a scientist messing with things he shouldn't be messing with. And in the back, it's the fly. We also had a mechanic called morbid, that things happen when creatures died. So all of a sudden, death became kind of scary because you never quite knew what was going to happen. And we had a mechanic called flashback, which would have spells happen again. That once things are in the graveyard, they could happen again. So you can make 13 zombies and then flash it back and make 13 more. So lesson number six is understand what emotion your game is trying to evoke. To be successful with your game, you need to know what your audience is trying to experience. What emotional response are you trying to create? In order to know what to put into your game, you have to understand what comes out. So you must continually ask yourself, what impact will this game choice have on the player experience? And if it doesn't contribute to the overall experience, it has to go. So back to college, I took a lot of classes in college. Uh, this time I took a screenwriting course. And the teacher taught me something that really stuck with me. So it talks about no scene is worth a movie, no line is worth a scene. So what that means is, no matter how good a scene is, if it's not serving the larger, larger movie, it has to be cut. And the same holds true for a line. If the line doesn't serve the scene, <laughs> you need to cut it. That the idea behind this whole thought was, it doesn't matter how good your line is. If it doesn't enhance the scene, get rid of it. It doesn't matter how good your scene is. If it doesn't advance the movie, get rid of it. So the same applies to game design. Because everything in the game has to contribute to the emotional output you're trying to create. If not, it has to go. So lesson number six, understand what emotion your game is trying to evoke. Like, once again, the theme of today is you're, humans are emotional creatures. You are trying to get a response out of them. Think about what emotion you're trying to get, and then make sure your game is moving in that direction, that all your components are trying to get the emotional response you're trying to get from your audience. Up on the wall. Lesson number seven. So this one happened on a plane ride to Gen Con. So that's a big gaming convention. Um, I was seated next to Christopher Rush. Uh, who sadly just passed away a few uh, weeks ago. Um, he is a magic illustrator, probably best known for illustrating Black Lotus, one of the most iconic magic cards. Um, also, not a lot of people realize this, but he also did all the mana symbols. So his, his work sticks with us today. So he and I were talking about land. So in, in the game of magic, land's the basic resource. It, it's a pretty 
boring part of the game in the big picture. It's not where the excitement lies. Um, and Chris came up with a neat idea. He said, what if we took the land, which looked like this at the time, and we made the art real big, and we did something exciting where the art was most of the card? And the rest of the people there said, uh, Chris, no. That, that's not what the land looks like, and who cares? We don't need it. The land's not the exciting part of the game. We don't need to worry about the land. So a year later... Uh, I made a set called Unglued, which is a, a very different kind of set. And so I put Full Art Land in. I said I thought it was a neat idea. And beloved. Players really liked it. So a number of years later, I did it again. I made the art bigger. Um, eventually, we started putting it in normal sets. And Zendikar had Full Art Land, very popular. Battle for Zendikar had them, very popular. And what we found was players really did attach to the land. It mattered to them. And it wasn't just a matter of full art that we started working up, trying really hard to make sure that all our lands had a very unique look to them so that we gave the player choices. That when you play an island, for example, obviously there's five basic lands, I'm showing island, that you had a lot of choices. We even experimented. There's some cards we made. which These are real, actual earth places that were on cards. And here's one, for example, the, the Guru Island that was made by Therese Nielsen. Very pretty. It's very rare. It's one of the most valued cards in the game because players do care. It's not... It's not just an island. It's not just a basic land. That players care about that. So that leads us into lesson number seven. Allow the player the ability to make the game personal. Okay, back to college. This time, an advertising class. So I learned something really interesting. So if you're in a store staring at a shelf and you've never purchased the product before, what are you most likely to purchase? The brand you're most familiar with. Why? Why is that? Because it's a little quirk in the brain. So it associates your knowledge of something with quality. Because if you know it, well, then it must mean it's better. That knowledge equals quality. Okay, for the psychologists out there, technically knowledge equals familiarity, which equals preference, which equals quality. But I'm shortcutting here by, by the transfer property works. Um, so the idea essentially is your brain just... It prioritizes the things you know. The things in your brain, it just thinks that they're better because you know them. So what this means in game design is it's important for your players to have a personal connection with your game. The more the players feel the game is about them, the better their brain will think of it. So how do you do that? Okay, provide a lot of choices. Give them different resources, different paths, different expressions. Give the player the ability to choose, and importantly, not to choose things. Allowing them to feel that what they choose is theirs. So, for example, in Magic, one of the things I think that really helps Magic is we give you so much choice. You can choose your colors. You can choose your creatures. You can choose your characters. You can choose your factions. You can choose your illustrations. And, of course, you can choose your frames, that there's so many options available to you. So lesson number seven is allow the player the ability to make the game personal. So just remember, the players will think more highly of things that they can find a personal connection to. And in order for you to do that, make sure you give them the choices to be able to find the things to, be, to make personal. Up on the wall. Lesson number eight. So this is from Gate Crash a couple years ago. Um, so in it, we had a card called Totally Lost. So this was... Not a particularly strong card. It never got played in constructed tournaments. People would play in limited. It's not bad in limited. Um, li limited is when you open the cards and you play with the cards that you open. Uh, so anyway, we needed something simple. The card makes the creature go away for a while. And so the artist said, okay, well, let's just show a creature getting lost in the city of Ravnica, which is where it took place. Um, uh, and so this little guy, uh, his name is Fibblethip. And he's a little homunculus, which means a creature made of magic. The audience really took the Fibblethip. Uh, they started putting them in different magic settings. <laughs> and non-magic settings. <laughs> Did everybody find them? It's right there. Okay, I'll help you a little bit. Right there. And there's Waldo. Um, they started doing memes with him. <laughs> that, 
They started making greeting cards. They put them in comic strips. They started making illustrations with him. They made figures out of him. Just, they really, really took to him and did all sorts of crazy things. And then we got in on the game. We started making cell phones and keychains. We even made a little plush. He's really cute. Um, And the players just really, really took to him. So much so that we started putting him back in the game. You guys catch this one? (laughs) So lesson number eight. The details are where your player falls in love with your game. So as the player explores, uh, explores their choices, they are searching for things to bond with. The players want to find a piece of the game to call their own. Now in Magic, players bond over cards or characters. Sometimes even over a single image. This is bear punching, very popular last year. Um, This means the details matter because the individual will bond with the game through the details. What might seem insignificant is anything but. That small detail may only matter to a tiny percentage. But to that percentage, it can mean everything because that might be the thing that makes the player fall in love with your game. So lesson number eight, the details are where the players fall in love with your game. I cannot stress this enough that it's very important that people want to, people are individuals. They want to sort of come to the game and find something that they can claim to be their own. And that that's going to happen in the details. So when people always say the details don't matter, that's not true at all. The details matter very, very much. It's not that everybody will care about every detail, but somebody will care about each piece of detail. And it's crucial that it's those details, it's those little tiny things, it's the little fibble tips of the world that really endear the audience to your game. So up on the wall. Lesson number nine. Okay, there are many different ways to play Magic. We refer to them as formats. So some formats we create. Standard uses the last 18 months worth of cards. Modern uses about the last 10 years worth of cards. A booster draft, you rip and open the cards and you draft them right out of the booster pack. So other formats are made by our players. Pauper uses just common cards. Emperor is a three-on-three match. But the current most popular player-made format is Commander. So Commander goes back. There were a bunch of judges way back when who all day long would judge. And when they were done judging, they wanted to play Magic. But they decided to make their own format. And so they were inspired by these five elder dragons from a set called Legends long ago. And so they made a format. Here's how the format works. You choose a legendary creature. You can see that on the card. These represent individual characters. These are specific people. Um, And then they act as the commander for your deck. And you add 99 other cards that match the color of your commander. So if your commander is like green and white, your cards have to be green, white, or green and white. No repeats. So 100 cards, one's your commander, 99 are other cards. They all have to match the color. Um, And commander was such a popular format that we, back in 2011, made a commander product that we, we, we put this out. Now, it was planned as a one-time thing, but it was so popular, we did something the next year and the next year. And now, it's just something we do every year. And the players have fallen in love with it. <laughs> and it's something that we didn't even generate. I mean, we obviously made the product, but the players generated this and created it, and it's become something that's an endearing part of the game. So lesson number nine, allow your players to have a sense of ownership. Okay, so once the players made choices and bonded over details, next, you need to add customization. You need to give them the ability to build things that are uniquely their own. Now, in Magic, this customization can happen through a format, um, but it's most often in Magic done through deck building. Players can choose any 60 cards or any 100 cards if they're playing Commander or other formats require other amounts of cards from over 15,000 cards. So by the way, when I said 14,000 earlier, that's on my watch. There's 1,000 that got made before I got there. Um, And then for each card, they get to pick which exact version they want. You know, there's different frames, there's different art, there's lots of choices. Um, And the result is, they don't just create a deck. They create their deck. Something that personally represents them. So when their deck wins, they win. Because the deck is no longer just a part of the game. It's an extension of themselves. So lesson number nine, allow your players to have a sense of ownership. 
this is very important, that if you want your players to bond as closely as you can, the game has to move beyond being yours and become theirs. You have to find a way to make sure that the player can do that. And the key is customization, because you want your player to be able to do something that nobody else could do, that they did, that's their creation. So up on the board. Okay, lesson number 10. So we made a card a while back called Summoner's Pact. So here's what Summoner's Pact does. It lets you go into your library, with your deck, and get a green creature out of it and put it in play. Um, the trick is it doesn't cost anything. Well, next turn you have to pay for it. You have to, you're putting on credit. Um, so you, you don't have to pay for it now. You have to pay for it next turn. Now, if you don't, you lose the game, but probably you won't cast this if you can't do that. So that's okay. So this card lets you get a free green creature out of your deck. I mean, free for the turn, but good enough. Maybe you'll win this turn. Um, okay, now we have a card called Hive Mind we made. So what Hive Mind does is it says whenever a certain kind of spell is played, you can copy it. So the idea is, let's say someone casts Divination. This lets you draw cards. Everybody gets a Divination. Everybody gets to draw cards. Okay, so what happens when Hive Mind meets Summoner's Pact? Hey, everybody gets a Summoner's Pact. But here's the problem. Everybody gets to get a green creature out of their deck. A lot of them don't even have a green creature in their deck. And... This is on payment. they got to pay this next turn or they lose the game. So you see where this is going. So we started with a card that gets a green creature out of your deck and another card that copies certain spells, but when you add them together, you win the game. Now, that's not something we built into that. When we made each of these cards, that was nothing we had in mind. This is something that the players came up with. So this is lesson number 10. Leave room for your players to explore. Okay, so I said you want to give them choices, you need to give them details, you need to give them customization. Okay, so let's talk about how they're presented. Okay, well, before I was a game designer, I worked in Hollywood. Uh, I was a TV writer, if you didn't know. In TV, there's something called the pitch. So the idea of a pitch is you stand up in front of the room and you have to sell people on your story. And this is very crucial. The difference between being a good writer and a bad writer is your ability to pitch. So I took a lot of classes in it. So the number one rule is don't talk at, at your audience. You want to talk with them. So here's one of the tricks they taught you. So when you're doing your pitch, you want to get your audience to ask questions. Why is that so important? Because people are more invested in things that they initiated. That if you just talk, they might drone you out. But if you get them to ask you a question, then they tune in because you're asking, you're answering their question. So this is very important. We come to game design. Don't always show the players the things you want them to see. Let your players find them. Give them the choices, to design and customization, but let it be things they discover. Because if they find it, they'll be more invested. So lesson number 10, leave room for the player to explore. This is very, very important. The idea of investment is a key part of what makes people bond. And so you want to make sure that you're not always giving it to them. Just like when I was doing my pitch, I didn't want to just give them the story. I wanted to get them to ask me the story because then they were invested in me telling it. Up on the wall. Okay, lesson number 11. So in R&D, we do something called a rare poll. So we want to understand what impact our rares and mythic rares are going to have on our audience. So what do we do? We ask magic players who work at Wizards, but not in R&D, to take a poll and give us their feedback. So each card's graded on a scale from 1 to 10. 1 means something you, would be, you, you don't want to play with. 10, you'd be very excited to open it up. Okay, then we collect all the data, and we use it to figure out which cards we should keep and which cards we should change. Okay, so which is better? A card which receives all 7s, or a card with half ones and twos and half nines and tens? I'll give you a second. Which one do you think is better? The second. A card with half ones and twos and half nines and tens. Why? Because we prefer cards that evoke a strong response, even if some of that response is negative. So it brings us to lesson number 11. If everyone likes your game, but no one loves it, it will fail. So my metaphor here is a blind date. So when you go on a blind date, you have a list of things you want, you're, the things you're looking for. And at the end of the blind date, if everything is checked off on your list, but there is no joy in the date, there is no excitement, there is no passion, 
it doesn't matter that you checked off your list. There won't be a second date. You know, the, the blind date isn't about not having negative things. It's about having something positive. So players don't need to love everything, but they need to love something. Something has to draw them into your game. Something they feel strongly about. Now, don't worry that players will hate something. Worry that no one will love anything. Because things that evoke strong responses will most often evoke strong responses in many directions. Meaning that it's almost impossible to make players love something without making other players hate it. In fact, some players enjoy hating what other players love. So it's almost impossible. So stop worrying about evoking a negative response and start worrying about evoking a strong response. So lesson number 11, if everyone likes your game but no one loves it, it will fail. And I can't stress this enough. People too often want to minimize the negative. They're so worried about not having anybody dislike something that they miss the big picture, which is that's not the important part. You have to make sure you evoke the positive response. People have to fall in love. There's a lot of attention out there. There's a lot of games to play. If your game doesn't make someone fall in love with it, guess what? They're going to go to a game that does. Up on the board. Lesson number 12. Okay, so in the game, we have planeswalkers. These are characters that cast magic, that duel with magic. You, the player, you're a planeswalker. And we spend a lot of time and energy on these planeswalkers. There are major characters in the story. In fact, we make cards out of them. And the planeswalker cards are very popular. In fact, they're some of the most popular cards we make. Whenever we have a new set, people always ask about the new cards. So this story goes back to Avacyn Restored in May of 2012. We made a card called Tybalt. So he was a devil planeswalker. They used like pain magic and a sharp dresser. Um, but we decided that he was only going to cost two mana. Because we had cards. We had four mana, three mana, six mana, five mana. We, we'd done all that. We'd never done a two mana planeswalker. Now, nothing about this being two mana serves the card or the character. We just wanted to see if we could do it. So what happened? One of the reasons people love Planeswalkers is they're powerful. They're good. We tend to make our Planeswalkers good. But by making it two mana, we didn't allow ourselves the ability to do that. And the reason they didn't like him was it just was weak because he cost two mana. So this brings us to lesson number 12. Don't design to prove you can do something. So I'm going to let you in on a secret. People who create tend to have large egos because it takes ego to will something into existence. Now, having an ego is fine. I personally have a very large ego. Um, but you can't let your ego drive your motivation. Remember, your goal is to deliver an optimal experience for your target audience. Your decisions have to serve your game and not you. So ask yourself, is this decision helping me achieve the optimal experience for my target audience? Or is it being done to fulfill an inwardly facing need for self-satisfaction? Because if the answer is the latter, you're doing it for the wrong reason. So number 12, don't design to prove you can do something. And one of the things, I think people fall in the trap. We are game designers, and most of us, or all of us pretty much, are game players. And it's really easy to fall in the trap to think of game design as a game that you're trying to have fun playing. But the problem is, it's not about enjoying the experience. It's not about testing yourself. It's about making the best game possible. So don't fall in the trap of sort of entertain yourselves for the sake of making your game the best the game can be. Up in the wall. Lesson number 13. We go back to 2004, a set called Unhinged. So this was a humorous set which broke a lot of rules that we never normally break because magic is often very competitive and the product wanted to remind people the game can be fun. Magic can be fun. So we put a silver border on it to say, you can't even play these in tournaments. It's non-tournament legal. Okay, so in it, we had a mechanic called Gotcha. So here's how Gotcha worked. If this card was in your graveyard, if your opponent did a certain thing, this card, particularly if they said the word kill or destroy, which happened to be the name of the card, you could say gotcha, and you could get it back from your graveyard. And there are all sorts of gotcha effects. If they said a number, if they touched the table, if they flicked their cards, if they touched their face, if they laughed. <sighs> if they laughed, you could say gotcha and get it back. So what, what was the best way to win this game? Well, don't talk, because you might say something. You know, don't interact, because you might do something. Don't do anything fun. You know, heaven forbid you laugh. Uh, so leads us to lesson number 13. Make the fun part also the correct strategy to win. It's not the player's job to find the fun. It is your job as a game designer to put the fun where they can't help but find it. 
Because when players sit down to a game, there's an implied promise from the game designer. The game designer says, if you do what the game tells you to do, it will be an enjoyable experience. So the players will do whatever the game tells them to achieve the desired goal, usually to win. Even if that isn't fun, they'll do it. And when the game is done, if the players didn't have fun, they will blame the game. And rightfully so. Because you, the designer, have messed up. You have not delivered on the promise. They did what you asked. You didn't, do, you didn't fulfill your end of the bargain. So remember, you have to make sure that what it takes to succeed at your game is the very thing that makes it fun. Fun cannot be tangential. It has to be the core component of your game experience. So le lesson number 13, make the fun part also the correct strategy to win. And then I see this mistake be made all the time where, like, they find something fun and then add other things around it. And the people, like, I, I, we do these things where you watch through a window and you, you see how your audience is playing the game. And sometimes they go the wrong path and they don't do what you expect them to do. Well, guess what? If they find unfun parts of your game, you put them there. You know, make sure that the fun part is you guide them there and they find it. Because that is what's going to make them love the game is the fun part. Well, make sure they find the fun part. Up on the wall. Lesson number 14. So this is Rise of Eldrazi back in 2010. So obviously it had the Eldrazi in it. These guys were giant and alien and hungry. They were eating the world. So at Common, we made a card called Ulamog's Crusher. So he was giant. He was 8-8, which for a Common is pretty big. He was an uh, alien. Look at him. He looks really weird. Also, most magic cards are colored. He was colorless. Um, and he was hungry. He had an ability called Annihilator. And Annihilator had a number. And every time you attacked, your, your opponent had to sacrifice that many things. So Annihilator 2 means every time you attacked, they had to sacrifice two things. So what would happen is we would play this, and we did some play testing, and the players wouldn't attack with him. And we're like, what, what's going on? And what we learned was, they were afraid. Here's this awesome creature. They finally got it out. They didn't want something bad to happen to the creature, so they weren't attacking with it. But we knew that attacking with it was really good. How could we educate them? How could we get them to realize they needed to attack with it? Well, the solution was force them to attack with it. <laughs> so we just said, okay, you have to attack. We put this on the, one of the common cards, and when they attacked, they realized it was good, and they did it more. And so the key was, by forcing their hand, we, we educated them. So lesson number 14, don't be afraid to be blunt. Artists tend to prefer subtlety. They're taught, show, don't tell. But sometimes subtlety doesn't work. People can just miss the obvious. For example, in magic, we use keywords to make sure that players can focus on the mechanics. But once upon a time, back in Mercadian Mass, back in 1999, we had mechanics, but we didn't name them. We, we didn't have keywords. And the number one question we got was, why doesn't the set have mechanics? So sometimes to get your audience to understand, you have to be willing to embrace, to embrace bluntness. I like to think of my creative tools as a toolbox. And sometimes you just need a hammer. So lesson number 14, don't be afraid to be blunt. We as artists are taught subtlety, 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 subtlety. And a lot of the times you want to be subtle, but that doesn't mean that you can't use bluntness when it's valuable and when it'll get across what you need to. Up on the wall. Okay, lesson number 15. So I created something a while back called Player Psychographics. I took an advertising class I told you earlier. There's a concept in advertising called psychographics where you're trying to understand the emotional needs of your audience. Why are they buying your product? And so the idea was I created these three psychographics to explain why our players played the game. What emotionally did they get out of the game? So first, there was Timmy or Tammy. There was Johnny or Jenny. And there was Spike. <laughs> okay, so Timmy or Tammy wants to experience something. It's very much about the visceral thrill, the, the excitement, or, you know, it could be the emotional bonding with friends. But it was about the, how they felt about it, what, how it made them feel. Jenny or Johnny wanted to express something. The game was about showing other people something about themselves through the lens of the game, through their deck, through cool card combos, through some means by which they can express something about themselves. 
Spikes want to prove something, that the game is a tool to show that they're capable of doing something. Often winning, but that's not the only thing Spike could be focused on. But they use the game as a resource to prove they're capable of doing something. So let's talk about Ravnica in 2005. We made a card called Molten Sentry. So here's what it did. You flipped a coin when it came into play, and then either you got a 5 two, meaning 5 power, 2 toughness, or you got a 2 power, 5 toughness. And both of them were interesting. Both were balanced. They both were interesting things you could get. So let's look at the psychic graphics and examine this. Uh, I'm going to take Johnny and Jenny out because this card really isn't for them. Okay, so we got coin flipping. Oh, Timmy likes coin flipping. That's exciting. What's going to happen? Timmy enjoys that. We had balanced outcomes. Okay, Spike likes that. Spike like both things are good things, and I, can, I have interesting choices. Spike enjoys that. But let's flip them for a second. Balance outcomes. Well, that's not really what Timmy's looking for. Timmy's looking for exciting things. When he flips the coin, ooh, is it, a bad thing or a good thing? He wants an exciting moment. And coin flipping, Spike doesn't want to flip a coin. He's all about skill. He, he wants to win. The, you know, yes, they're interesting choices, but he wants to make the choices. He doesn't want the choices to be random. So what happened when this card came out? The Timmies didn't like it because it was too spiky, and the Spikes didn't like it because it was too Timmy. You know, that, that the card, like, but trying to make different people happy, we made nobody happy. So lesson number 15 is design the component for the audience it's intended for. So, for example, when you aim to please everyone, you often please no one. All your players don't want the same thing out of your game. It's important to understand what different kind of things your audience want and to understand what kind of different players you have. So when you design any one component, you know which part of the audience it's intended for. Okay, him. This is for him. Protection from everything. Ooh, that's exciting. Um, and then you design the component for that audience. If other players don't like it, it doesn't matter. It's not for them. So lesson number 15, design the component for the audience it's intended for. You have lots of different players. They're going to want lots of different things. You have to figure out each component, who it is for, maximize it for that person. Forget everybody else. It doesn't matter. Remember, you want someone to love everything, not hate it. It doesn't matter if people hate things. Make sure each component is for the person it's made for. And you'll make something for everybody. You should make something for the, the person who hates this card. Hopefully will love that card. But you don't focus the card on who you're making it for. Okay, lesson number 16. So this is unglued. This was the first overboarded set. Uh, very humorous. So we, in it, we had a card called BFM, Big Furry Monster. And it was big, 99.99. I just talked about how 8.8 was big for common. Well, 99.99 is, is just big. In fact, this, you notice he has two earrings on him. Uh, those were the two biggest creatures in magic at the time we printed this card, which was an 11.11 and a 12.12. But he's big, he's 99.99. And it was so big, it had to go on two cards. You actually had to draw both cards in your hand to play it. So this inspired me to make this card which was, well, what if it went the opposite direction? Instead of it being so big that it requires two cards, what if it was so small that two of them could fit on one card? And in Invasion, back in September 2000, I made this card, or a bunch of these cards, known as split cards. So at the time, who was in favor of it? I was in favor of it. Bill Rose was in favor. He was the lead designer of the set. He's currently our VP of R&D. And Richard Garfield was in favor. He was the, the creator of Magic. Who was opposed to this? Everybody else. <laughs> um, and it wasn't, by the way, that they, they were thinking of what was best for magic. They were, were concerned. They felt like that wasn't what a magic card looks like. That, that isn't how we do things. And that it wasn't that the people who were against it, they had the best, the best idea of magic in mind. They were trying to help the game. But they really felt like we were breaking some boundary we, wouldn't, we shouldn't be breaking. But um, Bill and Richard and I, we, we were steadfast, and we slowly convinced everybody that it was the right thing to do. And so eventually, in Invasion, the split cards came out. What was the player reaction? No. They loved them. They were very, very popular. Um, so much so that we've revisited them and done them a, a bunch of different times. So le lesson number 16 is, be more afraid of boring your players than challenging them. So in my 20 years at Wizards, I've done a lot of groundbreaking things. And every time someone, usually multiple people, come, came out of the woodwork, full of passion and purpose, and they said to me, you can't do that. It's too risky. It will hurt the game. But interestingly, I've also created my share of boring mechanics. Yet, very few people ever had passion and purpose to stop me from making those. Why? Because people fear challenging the players more than boring them. But I think that's backwards. 
When you try something grandiose and it fails, the players will forgive you because they recognize that you were trying to do something awesome. They respect the attempt. And they stick around to see what you'll do next. But when you bore the players, there's no such forgiveness because making the same mistake is not the same as making a new one. When you bore the players, they resent you. Sometimes they stop playing. So as game designers, I think we have it reversed. Challenging the players isn't the bigger threat. The greatest risk is not taking risks. So lesson number 16, be more afraid of boring your players than challenging them. That I really know there's a lot of risk aversion of, oh no, oh no, what if you go something wrong? But respect your players. When you try new and different things, even when you fail, that's better received when you just do boring things. So be willing to challenge your fans. They'll, they'll appreciate it. Okay, last, number, lesson number 17, back to invasion. Um, so this was, had a multicolor theme. What that means is that the card had two or more colors in its casting cost. And in invasion, you were encouraged to play as many colors as you could. So invasion was very popular. So years later, we wanted to do another multicolor set. Ended up being Ravnica in October of 2005. So the question we said to ourselves is, how can we do another multicolor theme without it being too similar? So let's look at the back of a magic card. This is what we know as the color wheel, or the five colors of magic. So what if we made one small change, we thought? What if instead of encouraging players to play as many colors as possible, all five, we encourage them to play as few as possible, two? The reason two and not one is it wouldn't be multicolored if it was one. And when we looked at that with five colors, we realized that there are ten combinations. So there are ten two-color pairs. So we mapped them. And then we made guilds out of them. We gave them each a flavor. Like the Azores, for example, was all about law and order and control. It was white and blue. It took the elements of white and blue, combined them, and they were the, peop they were the people that made the laws in the world, and they were the bureaucrats. And for each of the, the guilds, we gave them a very specific flavor matching that. And then we took the guilds, and we put them in a city world, and we made Ravnica. What was the player response? They loved it. Ravnica is the most popular world we've ever created. The players just ate it up. So lesson number 17 is, you don't have to change much to change everything. So my uh, metaphor here is, I'm a bad cook. So it's my responsibility to make the vegetables. So for example, I need to take the peas out and put them in here. It's my job. So every time I put some peas in, and then I say, yeah, it's not enough peas. So I put more peas in. And then I'm like, eh, eh, that's not enough peas. So I put more peas in. And then I'm like, I did, and I put more peas in. And what ends up happening every time is this. Way too many peas. Um, I think game designers treat game components like I treat peas. <laughs> you're, you're never sure if there's enough, so you keep sticking more in. Then in the end, you have too much, and this causes problems. You create extra complexity for your players, you muddy the message of your game, and you waste resources you could use later. So I've had a slight change in perspective. So instead of asking how much do I need to add, I now ask how little do I need to add? So lesson number 17, you don't have to change much to change everything. When I look back at Ravnica, we really changed one tiny element of it, but that was enough. That one tiny change had a world of differences. It, no one's going to confuse Invasion with Ravnica. They're radically different sets, even though they're both multicolor. Up on the wall. Okay, lesson number 18. So every week, I write a weekly design column known as Making Magic. I do 50 new columns a year. I get a two-week break where we rerun columns. And I've been doing this since 2002. So some weeks are theme weeks. I have to write to a theme. It's Goblin Week or whatever. I have to write about goblins. Some weeks are open-ended. I can write whatever I want. Which is harder to write? The theme week or the open-ended week? The open-ended week. Because the theme week forced my hand and make me explore options I might not. So which is harder to design? The theme set or the open-ended set? The open-ended set. Because the theme set forced me down paths I might not normally have gone. So this gets us to lesson 18. And if you follow my podcast or read my column, this is probably the one I'm most famous for. Restrictions breed creativity. So there's a myth about creativity that the more options available, the more creative people can be. But this actually contradicts how we know how most brains work. You see, the brain is an amazing organ. It's very smart. So when you're asked to solve a problem, it checks its data banks and it asks itself, have I solved this problem before? And if the answer is yes, it solves it in the exact same way. 
the exact same way. So what it does is it uses the same neural pathways and does exactly what you did before. Now, most of the time, this is efficient. It lets you avoid relearning tasks each time you do them. But it causes a problem with creative thought because if you use the same neural pathways, you get to the same answers. And with creativity, that's not your goal. So here's the trick I've learned. If you want to get your brain to get to new places, start from somewhere you've never started before. That's why each time I start a new expansion, I make sure to have a different vantage point. I always say, let's start this place from a set I've never started before. This has forced me to think in different ways and create new problems to solve, which results in new ideas and new solutions, which means that restrictions aren't an obstacle, but a valuable tool. So you can make use of restrictions to help you be more creative. Lesson 18, restrictions breed creativity. So once again, I can't stress enough. Having restrictions. In fact, if you don't have restrictions, make restrictions. For example, my favorite article I ever wrote, I asked for the audience to give me two topics, a magic topic and a non-magic topic. The magic topic was my biggest design mistakes, and the non-magic topic was dating. <laughs> I would have never written that article. I never would have written that article, and it's my favorite article I've ever written. It's called The Air is Human. It's a topical blend one. Check it out. Put this up on the wall. Okay, lesson number 19. So one of my jobs, I'm a spokesperson for magic, I interact with various sources of media. I do a lot of interviews, including social media, where I'm active on numerous platforms. I have over 80,000 followers. I probably spend the most time on Tumblr, though, because of this. This is my blog, a.k.a. Blogatog, magic joke for the non-magic players out there. Um, so in four years, I've made over 64,000 posts, and of them, I, uh, whoops, I've answered over 60,000 questions. Four years. Um, I interact a lot with our fans. Um, and not just online, but also in person. So after this, by the way, in the wrap-up room, which is across the street at level, um, level 2 in West Hall, I will be there, I will sign, uh, sign cards, I will take pictures, I will shake hands, I will answer questions, but that's not going to be in this room, it's going to be there. So afterwards, if you're interested, I will be there, and I'll stay until I've talked to everybody and signed everything. Um, anyway, that leads to the lesson, lesson number 19. Your audience is good at recognizing problems and bad at solving them. So my metaphor here is a doctor appointment. What does a doctor always do first? They ask how you're feeling. Because you know better than the doctor how you're feeling. But the doctor doesn't often ask you how to solve the problem because they're better equipped than you to do that. Same is true in game design. Your players have a better understanding of how they feel about your game. You're trying to create an emotional response? Well, they know what that is. They can tell easier when something is wrong. And they're excellent at identifying problems. But they're not as equipped to solve those problems. They don't know your tools. They don't know your limitations. They don't know a lot of things they would need to know. And so they're not particularly good at solving problems. So please use your audience as a resource to discover what's wrong, but take it with a grain of salt when they offer solutions. So lesson number 19, your audience is good at recognizing problems and bad at solving them. And I must stress again, they're really, really good at recognizing problems. They're a great barometer. You should use that as a resource. But just take it with a grain of salt. Their solutions don't always work. Okay, lesson number 20. So when you look up on the board, I started to realize that, for example, if I'm trying to make sure that I match human nature, it's a little easier if my audience feels a sense of ownership because they're less inclined to feel like it's contradicting human nature. Or, for example, if I want them to... Uh, I can't read this. Um, if I want them to understand the difference between... If I push them to make it more... Um, if I push it to make it more compelling and not boring, I'm more likely to make it something... Is that right? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm more likely to make sure that it's something that will be compelling to them. Um, or if I have them to explore, it's more likely that the details will matter because if they're exploring, they'll want to find the details and that makes them more interested in exploring. And what I found was, as you started connecting these different things, they all start coming together. which is lesson number 20. All the lessons connect. That as I learned each lesson, I began to see they existed in relationship to one another. And that's when I realized that they weren't separate lessons after all. In fact, when I was going to give my talk today, the original title was 20 Years, One Very Complex, Interconnected, Holistic View of Game Design. <laughs> um, but it didn't seem quite as catchy. So lesson number 20, all the lessons connect. I, I didn't really give you 20 lessons today. I gave you one really large interconnected um, but I broke them apart for, for easy digesting. So let's put this on the wall. Okay, so guys, take your pictures. Okay, did everybody get a picture? 
Well, quickly, give me a sure. And I know some of you guys like lists. So here it is in list form. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got the picture? So that is 20 years, 20 lessons. Do I have time for questions? Real quick. Do I have time for questions? I don't know my time. Do I have time for questions? Yes or no? I don't know my time. Do I have time for questions? What? Wrap up? Oh, no, sorry, I don't, I don't have time for questions. Um, so thank you guys very much for joining me today. Once again, please fill out your forms. Uh, it's very important if you liked what happened today or, or you didn't like what happened today, let them know. Um, they, but when I got here, they gave me a deck that showed the people, the 50 best talks of last year to inspire me to be one of those 50 people. So if you like this, please fill it out. If you liked or didn't like it, please fill it out either way. Um, but thank you guys very much for coming.